Okay, hello everyone. My name is Anton. Uh, this is Gallery. We're with IBM. We're going to be talking about GDPR, and we were wondering how many people in Texas will come to listen about European data protection policy. <laughs> okay, but hey, we got enough uh, got enough people to uh, talk about. This. Okay, so uh, we got what? We got uh, about two dozen slides that we're going to go through. We got Q and A session at the end. Okay, and uh, feel free to. Uh, Ask questions. Uh, so, you know, we're from IBM, so we need to have some legal disclaimer, obviously, right? Essentially, the point of this disclaimer is to say that GDPR is a legal requirement. It's not a technical requirement, right? T technical, that's how you implement it, that's how you address it, but it's a legal requirement, okay? So, everything we're going to be talking about here today, that's not a legal advice. We're going to be talking about how we address it, right, and what worked for us, okay? But if you want to address it and Trust me, I'll explain why everyone should be uh, concerned about GDPR, right? Uh, you know, you need to get legal advice as well, because as I said, first of all, it's a legal requirement, okay? So that's the rough agenda for today. We'll uh, spend some time, probably less than a minute, talking about what we do to set some context, okay, to explain why GDPR was crucial for what we do, right? And terminology, uh, key issues, and how do we handle uh, GDPR? in where we work, what we do, Q&A, and the end. Okay, so uh, me and Gallery were working on IBM Cloud Application Identity Service. Essentially, in a nutshell, this is what it does, okay? You're building applications in cloud, okay? And we don't care which cloud you run on. It's not like IBM Cloud, right? You're building your applications. They run somewhere in cloud. You want to introduce authentication to those applications, okay? So we provide authentication and authorization as a service, okay? That's our bread and butter. If you're familiar with uh, AWS Cognito, Auth0, uh, Azure, what they call it, uh, B2C, Active Directory, right? Those are similar features. Essentially, the idea is developers don't need to learn all the security specifications and how to properly do security, not to be compromised with everything. We provide it as a service, okay? To give a little bit deeper picture of what we do, right? Essentially, no need to focus on every single detail any application running anywhere, right? And any identity source or identity provider running anywhere, on cloud, on-prem, doesn't really matter. The service that we, uh, that we work on is essentially connecting applications and identities, okay? So the common way to name it is identity as a service. Three major pillars of what we do, that's our icon on top there, that's us, is authentication, okay? And obviously, if you have authentication, you need to have authorization as well. User management and application user profiles, okay? And I'm emphasizing this because all of this is related to user data, some kind of information about users, emails, social securities, uh, I don't know, photos, whatever, right? It's all user data, and GDPR strictly talking about user data. So this is the reason GDPR was crucial for us to understand for our service, because again, we're a service, okay? We're not doing uh, applications for end users, right? We're IBM, so we're working with companies that build applications for their users. So we're providing authentication as a service to whoever wants to build their application cloud, okay? So roughly five months ago, that's what every single inbox on the planet looked like, okay? Around May 25th, everyone was starting to, uh, to get emails saying, we're compliant, this service is compliant, we're updating our policies, we're updating our rules, right? If you recall, not so long ago, a lot of emails were flowing the week around May 25th this year, okay, saying we've updated everything. And if you look at the sender, right? So this is major league soccer. I'm not really sure what they have to do with Europe, right? Because GDPR, that's a European thing. And others like uh, Uber, for example, or many American companies, they were updating the stuff, uh, their stuff, their policy, uh, policy, data policies as well. Okay, so uh, wh why exactly everyone had to update, so Spotify, for example, why everyone had to update their policies due to this European guideline, right? So to put it simply, what G G GDPR is, uh, it's talk about three things, compliance, data protection, and personal data. So first of all, uh, from compliance perspective, GDPR, it's a single regulation to rule them all. It defines the policies of data management, the processes, the organizational changes you need to uh, make in order to be compliant. It also defines what does it mean to be compliant. And the compliance responsibility for being compliant is actually on, well, on us, on you, on whoever providing the service. 
Data protection. So that's, uh, as I said previously, right, GDPR is a legal requirement. It's not a you must encrypt with RSA or whatever technical requirement. It's a legal requirement. You must have data protection, okay? And that's a fancy you term for data security, encryption, access control, monitoring, reporting, audit, et cetera, et cetera, right? So data needs to be protected according to the guide. Personal data. Uh, what's very new about GDPR is that it completely redefines what personal data is. And the definition, I have a separate slide defining what personal data is according to GDPR. The definition is much more, well, it significantly differs from previous definitions. So if you're familiar with, uh, there's a US term, uh, PII, right? GDPR is significantly more than that. Okay, so we'll, we'll get there. So uh, to give some numbers, right, a GDPR is uh, a little bit more than 260 pages, okay, 99 chapters, 173 uh, recitals, and 14 key issues that we will talk about today. So it's almost 300 pages of legal requirements, how to treat data, okay? It's a very fun document. Okay, let's go forward. Okay, so let's dive a little bit deeper into what GDPR is. So GDPR is uh, active today. The, the regulation is uh, actually being used today. It came, uh, it, it, uh, so it, technically it was uh, the beginning game of enforcing this regulation in okay, uh, earlier this year. So it's about five months. The regulation was announced two years before that. So companies had about two years to actually update their stuff. At the moment, it's not very strictly enforced. It's kind of soft run to trying to understand what's going on, okay? And the reason for that, right? First of all, it has a global impact, okay? Yes, it's a European data protection regulation, but it applies to everyone, okay? And I'll explain in a moment why it does. And the potential penalty for not being compliant is per percent of your uh, annual turnaround or uh, 20 million euros, which is 20 something million dollars, 24, something like that, okay? And, uh, the highest, right? They will not take the lowest, the highest. And what's important about this penalty for non-compliance, it's per incident, okay? So uh, no one wants to be there, that's for sure, okay? So a little bit about global impact. Okay, <clears throat> uh, yes, it's European regulation, okay? But according to that regulation, it applies to any EU data subject. And that's the first term uh, that I would like to define here. What is uh, EU data subject? So according to GDPR, data subject is defined as any human, okay? It's, you know, it has to be a human entity, person, right? That is currently inside of European Union. It's not a citizen of your European Union, right? It's not a resident, it's any human being currently in EU. So you traveling to London, well, not sure about London, you're traveling to Paris makes you uh, an EU data subject, okay? So if you're in EU for two weeks, and there is a company, uh, American company, con collecting your data in that time frame. that data falls under GDPR. Fun, right? So if there is a company in New York promoting uh, travel to US, to European, well, to everyone in the world, Europeans being part of that everyone in the world, yes, they fall under GDPR, okay? So every single person in EU at any given moment considered to be a EU data subject. So uh, the definition is very, very strict here. <clears throat> security of personal data. Okay, essentially security of personal data talks about how to secure personal data. First of all, it defines what personal data is and that's my following slide. Okay, uh, uh, and it defines what encryption needs to take place. How do you encrypt your data? How do you ensure that data uh, is secured in transit, right? GDPR doesn't say that you only can keep your data in Europe. No, you can keep your data outside of Europe. But if you want to keep it outside of Europe, you have additional 50 pages of rules how exactly this should be done, how do you transfer that data, et cetera, et cetera. So GDPR talks about how to secure your personal data. A huge part of GDPR is consent, okay? So this is something relatively new. And uh, I think the easiest way to summarize it is instead of opt out, users have to opt in, okay? So no more pre-check checkboxes, okay? Users have to opt in into using a particular feature. Moreover, if you want to share user information with some third party for some processing, users have to explicitly opt in for that. So you need to notify user that I'm planning to share your information with this, I don't know, whatever company, right, for advertising, right, uh, Facebook, Google, right. Uh, users have to explicitly uh, approve that action, okay? So consent is a huge part of GDPR. 
Accountability of compliance. GDPR defines very clearly that companies that process data, that collect data, that work with data uh, are accountable. Oops, wrong button. Are accountable of being compliant. Okay, so essentially you have to audit everything. Okay, and uh, you have to those uh, 99 chapters or 100 chapters I was talking about. You have to provide proof that you're compliant. Okay, it's not just self certification saying yeah I'm compliant. No. You actually need to provide a proof that you're compliant with those regulations. And the last part is data protection by design and by default. This is interesting. Essentially, this implies that you need to provide proof that you're taking data privacy into consideration when you're designing your system. Okay, so no more just let's store that data in, the, in SQL. Okay, not that easy. Okay, you need to consider, okay, how do I encrypt that data? Where do I keep my encryption keys? Do I keep my encryption keys per customer or per user of that customer? So all of those considerations are relevant uh, under GDPR. Okay, let me just quickly take a look if I forgot something in my notes. Okay, so we're good here. So I'm using a lot of terminology here and that's a terminology dictated by GDPR. So uh, I, I wanna overview this, uh, give like a quick overview of the terminology that's used by GDPR. So first of all, data subject. We talk about that, that's identifiable living natural person, right? That's the official definition. Know that it's identifiable, not identified, identifiable. So any piece of information that can be used ever to identify anyone falls under this. Uh, data controller, okay? So that's a major term in GDPR. It's a legal entity that determines the purpose and means of processing uh, of personal data. So essentially that's an entity that owns data, okay? So uh, as an example, I will be using our service, FID, right? So our customers who are using our service for authenticating users, they own data. We do not own their data, okay? We're just doing processing of that data, right? So it's not, so data controller, that's the entity that owns user data, right? And obviously because it's a controller, it decides how to control that data, okay? Data processor, so in our case, that's us, right? That's another legal entity that does processing of that personal data on behalf of the controller. So it's up to controller to define rules, how this data should be processed, okay? Stored, uh, encrypted, deleted, et cetera, et cetera. And it's up to processors to follow those rules. And I have it on one of my subsequent slides. Uh, essentially, controller is responsible for processor being compliant. Okay, so if processor got, got a problem, right, controller got a problem automatically as well. So personal data, that's actually my uh, next slide. Any information related to a data subject, regardless where it is stored. Any information about anyone being physically in EU uh, at any point, doesn't really matter if you store the data in Europe, in Americas, in uh, Asia, doesn't really matter, okay? So all of that is considered personal data. Processing, that's relatively easy, that's any operation perform of personal data. So that's playing CRUD operations, right? Or updates or backups or whatever. Any operation that can be performed. Bank transactions, for example, okay? And the last three are data privacy. Okay, so that's the right of individual to control how their public and non-public personal data is, uh, is collected and used. So essentially what it means, your data is a, your data subject and your data belongs to you. So you have full control over what's going on with the data. Who this data is shared for, okay? You want uh, GDPR entitled data subject to request a report of what's going on with their data at any given moment, okay? So uh, you can go to data controller, I don't know, let's take a couple of examples, right? You're a customer of uh, an airline company, right? Without calling any particular names. Airline company shares your information with a, some hotel chain, okay? So essentially, well, with multiple hotel chains. Hotel chain. Under GDPR, you can go to that airline company and say, okay, I do not want my information to be shared with Hilton. I'm okay with this information being shared with Marriott or Best Western or whatever, right? So GDPR essentially implies that Yes, users are empowered to fully control their data, uh, including how, when this data is deleted, uh, when this data is backed up, et cetera, right? And you as data controller got, if I recall correctly, it's something like seven days to produce a report if user asks you to, okay? It's very harsh rule. So data security, this is more of a technical thing, right? And Gallery will be talking about that uh, in a couple of slides. Essentially, this is the protection of personal data against 
lots, lots unauthorized access, destruction, use, modification, disclosure, et cetera, et cetera. Speaking technical terms, this is how you encrypt data. This is how you implement your access control. This is how you address your backups, right? All this information. So this is data security. And data governance uh, defines who can take uh, what actions with what personal data, when, under which circumstances, using what methods. So essentially, it's a set of rules, right? This is uh, what you do. This is how you do it and who's allowed to do that. OK, we're good so far? OK, I, I just got like, a couple of slides. Left. OK, so the definition of personal data. OK, this is the fun part. Any information relating to identified or identifiable natural person. So uh, you can see this list on your screen, uh, on my screen right here, right? Basically, it's much more expensive than standard PII, OK? A, a good example of that would be IP address. IP address is not part of PII. It is part of uh, personal data, OK? Any identifier, such as just picking random what biometric data, data concerning health or data concerning a natural person's sex life or sexual orientation, any of these is considered personal data, okay? And this data needs to be protected, this data needs to be governed, and essentially everything uh, I had on my previous slide. GDPR does not define what exactly specifically personal data is, it gives guidelines, okay? Essentially, this kind of way, right? So you have personal data, standard things like name, uh, IDs, or social security, location, online identifier that's your IP address or your, I don't know, Facebook user ID or whatever user ID you're using in any other system. And this, you can understand, is very closely related to what we do, right? We're doing user management, right? We're all about IDs, right? Uh, and uh, information. So with a uh, personal data definition being this broad, right, we definitely had to rethink how do we treat data. So. It's not as simple as, well, we just, we'll just use database in uh, somewhere in Germany, right? Because it's on Europe soil, right? It's right there and we're good. No, it is much more significant than that. So uh, two, of my, two of my last slides. Uh, to summarize uh, the overall definition of GDPR, it's a good thing. It's not a pretty thing, right? But for users, it's actually not a bad thing, right? Uh, You've all heard of data breaches and, uh, you know, I'm probably getting at least 10 calls a day and my iPhone saying scam likely, right? You're probably getting, uh, getting that as well, right? Uh, GDPR prevents abuse of data. GDPR is one uh, regulation to rule them all, meaning uh, <clears throat> there were a lot of different rules and regulations before GDPR. The idea of GDPR is to kind of centralize everything and make sure there is one rule to follow, even that rule is very broad, okay? Uh, previous, all the previous regulations were done, were created before the age of Instagram and mobile phones and et cetera, so GDPR addresses that uh, very precisely, right? GDPR gives a very, uh, a somewhat precise definition to personal data, okay? So yes, it will use things like your name and your ID number, Right, but it will also define more abstract terms of what might be considered personal data. Okay, and GDPR uh, enhances the uh, sense rights of individuals located in EU. EU right, so uh, as an individual, you have a right to get information, uh, what, what's going on with your data, to access data, right, to rectify, raise, object, uh, etc. Give or withdraw data uh, specific content. So as I said, you can decide that data uh, controller should not be sending your data to a particular data processor, okay? So it's your decision. You do not want your data to be shared with, uh, you know, particular company, okay? Inside is automatic, uh, inside is automatic decision making, transfer personal data to other providers. So the last one is interesting. Essentially, originally, everyone thought that uh, GDPR means your data has to be physically in Europe, right? And it only affects those who store data in Europe. No, it is not. Your data can be anywhere. Okay, but if that data relate was collected about a person, right, data subject while that data subject was in Europe, right, uh, you need to follow GDPR for that data. Okay, so originally, right, we thought, hey, we'll just implement it. Geller will talk about our service runs in multiple regions across the globe, right, and we thought, hey, we'll just implement it in Europe, right, and others are not. No, that's not the case. We had to implement it across the board, right, for every single region. Okay, so we're GDPR compliant in Sydney and in Washington, even though it's not Europe, right? Why? Because there might be European customers, right, who are uh, using our service in Sydney. 
They might be Australian companies who are providing services to European, okay? And all of that falls under GDPR. So GDPR has a huge organizational impact, right? Uh, literally, we have, well, we're IBM, right? We have an army of lawyers looking at this and providing guidance, okay? And this hugely affected every, pretty much every part of what we do, okay? So it took, I don't know, it took us probably something like four to five months to actually stay calm, right, regarding GDPR saying, okay, no one's gonna give us 20 million euro fund, okay? So uh, organizational impact is huge. First of all, controllers and processors are liable for breaches. Uh, there is a rule in GDPR saying uh, any data breach that you have, you have to make a public announcement within 72 hours, okay? 72 hours is not even enough to understand that you actually had a data breach, okay? Three days, come on, right? You, you, you don't have enough time to properly react to that, but you have to make a public announcement, okay? The data was breached, and then you can continue evolving that announcement. Controllers are bound to validate processor's compliance, right? So if you're, as a controller, you decide to share data with new processor, it's up to you. Uh, you're responsible for validating that that processor is compliant. DPO, data protection officers, are now mandatory, right? So uh, they're mandatory for companies above 250 employees. But if you're such a company, you need to uh, assign a data protection officer, professional, and there are a set of requirements for that professional that will be responsible for data protection in your company. Uh, security, data security, breach management, uh, talked about this. Processor is jointly responsible for cross-border uh, data transfer. So if you're in Europe, but you're sharing data with a processor in a different country, like in a different continent, right? It's your shared responsibility to ensure that GDPR uh, is solved. Uh, documented audible. So we're going to be talking about uh, audit. In uh, increased cost of non-compliance, you know, I think 4% or 20 million euros. It's kind of self-explanatory. No one wants to be there. So as of today, I don't, I haven't heard of anyone being fined or uh, no one got that fine, right? Because they still run in like a software unknown, right? Uh, checking that everyone is compliant. But it will be great to see, well, it wouldn't be great to see someone fine, but I, I do expect to see the first occurrence of this fine happening to understand how exactly a company got there. Okay, not us. <laughs> okay, data privacy authorities in power, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the last piece here is the DPR applies to controllers and processors located in EEA, so that's economic European area. It also applies to controllers and processors located outside of EEA, if they are processing personal data, and you remember, personal data that practically anything, in relation to the offering of goods and services to individuals located in EAA. Not Europeans, individuals located in EAA. So if I travel to Europe today, right, uh, I become uh, one of the right, individuals located in EAA, or for purpose of monitoring their behavior. So that's why roughly five months ago, right, all the companies, most of the companies, right, uh, started sending those uh, notices, right, because basically saying, hey, we're compliant, so, because that's the first part in GDPR, making sure you are compliant, and then notifying, right, everyone saying, we're compliant, okay, and if you need some proof, we got a proof, we got proof, right, I, I cannot say for everyone, but we do have proof. So uh, let's go to a little bit more technical piece, right? How we actually got there. We're good on time? Oh yeah, we're good on time. <laughs> okay, so I was talking about theory. Now let's talk about uh, how we actually got there from a technical standpoint. So those are 14 key issues as defined in GDPR. Okay, uh, we'll talk about consent, DPOs. Uh, we, I haven't talked about email marketing because we're, we're not doing that, right? That's completely relevant for us. Encryption, fines, personal data, privacy by design. Right, so uh, we picked a few, right? We picked uh, six out of 14, which are very relevant to what we do. Okay, and we decided to elaborate a little bit about how exactly we achieve that in our service. So, Gallery, we'll talk about that. I think I'm gonna use this. Can you hear me? Excellent. Okay, so as Anton mentioned that so, so App ID is being deployed in multiple geographical regions, right? So we have Dallas, Washington, London, Frankfurt, Sydney, and more coming up. But the point is that not only are we, is GDPR compliant, it, it, it applies to us because we are actually in Frankfurt, but also because the, the data subjects that we're, we, we, are, uh, we hold their information are going to be in Europe. So we live in a very 
um, fluid world and everyone's using cloud services. And so we need everywhere, Dallas, Washington, Sydney, they all need to be compliant with GDPR. So the first question really is, so once we've answered the, the, the question of whether or not we need to actually be compliant, we need to ask the question of, so what are we? Are we a data processor are we, or a data controller? And this is kind of tricky because in a way we actually have, so, so as Anton mentioned, so we are a authentication company. We are, uh, I'm sorry, authentication service. We federate identity information. We actually store uh, profile information for the user. So we collect information, right? And so all of these, so, though, is, so we store and process information. But what, the way we do it is that we say, you, the consumer, the customer, the app developer, are the owners. And we provide REST APIs for everything that we do, right? So we have for all the data that we own that, or that we store, we provide APIs that allow the user, the customer, to actually control. And so they can, they can do CRUD operations on them. They can delete them at their will. And so the way we've set up App ID is that we are a data processor and the customer is a data controller. And that's really important in the way that, 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 uh, that GDPR applies to us. So, okay, so the next step is now that we say, okay, so we're a data processor. So what kind of, uh, what kind of personal data do we actually store? And as Anton mentioned, so there are lots of different types of personal data, right? Um, so we have not only the identity of the user, the authentication information, passwords, et cetera, that we, we store, but also their social network. The, you know, what, how are they using our service? What kind of configuration? How, how, is, our, how is the way that they're using our service? Con you know, how, how, how have they configured our system? Um, then the question becomes, what's the retention time? So are we actually storing information longer than is necessary? Do we get rid of it? Is there a TTL for that information that we're storing? What about data protection? And this data protection doesn't just mean data in transit. And when I say data in transit, I'm not, again, I'm not talking about when we have data that's flowing from the web application, for example, let's say, or your application to the service, but even within the service, even within the microservices that, that are being hosted, right? And what about the modules outside, what about the database? Is everything, is the data that's being passed around in transit, is it all secure? Is it secure at a communication level or is it secure at a field level? So that needs to be considered. And then what about data at rest? So, what, so are we storing it, are we storing the data in our databases? Uh, or do we secure it at a disk level? Do we, what about caching? What about backups? You know, so <laughs> what about all the different copies of data that we store in order to make things easier for us? And then there's data deletion. And data deletion, that's a key part of the whole idea of the right to be forgotten. If someone doesn't want certain information to be kept, then they have the right to say, delete that data, right? I'm the owner of that data, I want it to be deleted. And so this is kind of tricky because there are different definitions of deletion. So for example, NIST says that the way they define, uh, define destruction, actually data destruction, is that it's not enough that you delete the, 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 the handler to a piece of data, right? That, so what you actually need to do is you need to go to the piece of memory and you need to write and at a bit level, we need to overwrite that piece of memory at least three times, right? That's how you make sure that you don't get the data back. <coughs> so that's data destruction. Fortunately, GDPR doesn't say data destruction. They're talking about data deletion. But again, when they talk about data deletion, they're talking about backups. They're talking about copies. They're talking about, so you need to consider all of that. So, okay, so let's give an example on our side. So we have, we definitely have user authentication information. We have account details. We have custom attributes, and these custom attributes are, for example, if, you're, if you have an application and you want to get, let, let's use the example of an of a, of a airline company, for example, and they want to keep, I don't know, their, let's say that's, uh, United, and they have mileage plus number, right? Let's say they want to have mileage plus number of their, of their users. So that's some kind of custom attribute that they can keep. Um, so we have all kinds of data, right? But again, the point is that this data is, is, is controlled and owned by either the customer or the data subject. Then what we say is retention time is it's really customer decision. So it's, it's what, again, based on the APIs that we provide, we say it's you tell us when you want to delete it and, and we, we won't keep it after that. Data protection, we'll talk about the field level encryption in a sec and it's, uh, 
It's kind of cool. And then the data deletion part, the way we have it is that, again, we have data delete APIs, but then we have it, what we do is that uh, we have a cryptographic destruction as well. And by that, what I mean is that if you delete a key, for example, the idea is that, and if your encryption scheme, for example, is semantically secure, then you're not going to be able to get the data back, right? Okay, so data protection at rest. So this is kind of one of the most important parts of, of, of the way we keep, uh, the way we've, we've actually protected the data that we have. And the thing is, it's, it's a, so we have customer data, we have user data, the most important parts of, you know, parts of any, 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 <laughs> any, any, uh, any service. But so what we need to do is we make sure we need to have isolation and we need to make sure that we have, uh, we have proper protection along the way. And so what we do is we take advantage of a pattern called a key hierarchy. And what a, what a key hierarchy basically is, is that you have a tree of keys, right? So you have one key here and you have keys along the, the nodes of each of the tree as you come down. And the idea is that each parent key ends up encrypting the, the child key. So for example, you have the root key over there and the root key has two child keys. It has pertinent key root key one and pertinent key root key two, right? And that root key encrypts the pertinent key root key and, and the two. And each of those pertinent root keys, they encrypt their own children, right? And so the idea is that if you actually, so, so actually there, there are lots of, so this simple pattern actually incorporates a lot of really neat security ideas. As an example, let's say that, that uh, so that pertinent root key one, I should have put actually, uh, I, I, I identifiers on them, but let's say the top one, the, per, uh, the tenant root key one. So let's say that gets leaked. So what ends up happening? The way that the, the tree is set up, if that key gets leaked, then only the subtree underneath it gets compromised, right? Because that's the only thing that you have access to. And so, so you've managed to isolate your area of atta your attack surface, essentially, right? Um, the, other, the other kind of cool thing is that you're, you're kind of building in the idea of uh, the principle of least privilege, because you're saying if you really only need to have access to this kind of information, that's all I'm going to give you. You don't need to have access. So for example, you have the data encryption key and you have the token signature key. There's no reason for you to have, if you have the data encryption key, there's no reason for you to have the token signature key, right? So we've isolated, we've kind of divided up the different keys based on the roles of the users or based on the roles of the actions that we're trying to do. So um, then we also have the fact that you kind of can kind of build a root of trust, right? So now we have, we say, okay, so your root key can be, we're gonna have to, we have to really make sure that we have a really strong uh, root of trust. So we say our root key is going to be stored and protected in HSM. HSM is a hardware security module, right? And what's really cool about HSMs are they're, the, they're, they're physical devices, they're physical protection, logical protection of actual pieces of information. So they're, they're all kinds of tamper, whatever, tamper starts. They're tamper resistant. They're tamper responsive, meaning that if you actually, if they detect that there's something going on, they, they can, they might, based on the policy that they, they have, they might delete the information that they have inside them. Their tamper, what are the other ones? Well, for example, if they see that someone's, being, someone's tampering them, they can go and alert someone or they can go and, you know. So they're, they're very, very responsive and very, very protective pieces of hardware. So, but the idea is that they're also kind of, isolated and they're, they're, they're slower. And so, you know, you might want to have fast decryption or fast encryption. And so if you have a separate physical device, then you're not going to be able to do that. So again, by having this logical partitioning of your keys, what you end up doing is that you give only pertinent information to that HSM. You let that piece of hardware do its magic and that root key never actually leaves the HSM. So you don't say, hey, HSM, give me your key while I decrypt per pertinent key, root key one. You actually say, hey, HSM, here's my ciphertext, or here's my encrypted data, give me the, the plain text of that data, right? So, so the root key never actually leaves that device. Okay, so, um, and there are also a bunch of other really cool things, like if you want to roll over your keys, 
right? In that case, you don't actually have to go back and delete, your, or you don't have to roll over a bunch of different things. You can go back, go to that particular key that you want to roll over, change it, and then you can go and, again, encrypt it using its parent key. So all of this, meaning what happens? So now let's say that, let's say a particular tenant, oh, and so, yeah, so the, let's say a particular tenant decides that they want their information to be deleted, right? And so now what we do is that if we delete this, uh, delete, delete this particular tenant key, then it goes and, again, because we're using a secure encryption scheme, what ends up happening is that the data encryption key that we had, that, that's a cipher text essentially, is going to be indecipherable from a, or indistinguishable from random text. So basically it becomes useless for us. And then the information in our, da in our database that's actually specific to that tenant also becomes indecipherable for us from random text. And so what we've done is we've done cryptographic destruction of our data based on tenants, right? So we can do the same thing, uh, this kind of, we can, we can crypto, so this, is, this whole thing is called cryptographic data isolation. And we can do similar things uh, at a more granular level or at a higher level, depending on what we actually want to do. Okay, so great. So we've talked about data uh, protection. Uh, and we've kind of touched on data deletion. But what's really important now is this idea of copies. So we have, it's not like we actually have one piece of, you know, one copy of your, I don't know, of your whatever, your custom, info, your authentication information, and we store it in this database, and no one else, you know, once you tell us you want to delete it, we delete it. That's not the way it works, right? So in order for us to have a highly available system, in order to have a resilient system, what we actually, or every service needs to do is they need to have an infrastructure which, for example, in that case, we are multi-region, right? In each region, we are highly available. It means that, ooh, it means that we have three data centers in each region. In each of these data centers, we are made up of, we basically have a, we have containerized microservices that are running on Kubernetes, right? And each of these clusters that we have, they have at least three worker nodes and so forth. And you can imagine, and, and then in each of the, <laughs> and then for each region, we also have their own Redis databases and we have, you know, cloud NoSQL databases and so forth, right? Point is, you can imagine that at every stage, first of all, we have a lot of data that's actually being transmitted from service to service, from node to node, but also we have a lot of data that's being cached and that's being stored, right? So how do we actually make sure that this data is being kept protected first? And then how do we make sure that this data is deleted when we want it to be deleted? Or it's, it's updated the way we want it, the, the way it's, it's supposed to be? And so we have to make sure that it's done. <laughs> so for what the stuff that we actually, for the, for the, for the, for the oops, well, I'll include that, but essentially, for the, for the places that we have control over, right? So we make sure that this is being done, right? And then for the services that we are using, so for example, we're using Cloudant, which, uh, so what we're doing in Cloudant, for example, is we have a service level, and, you know, when, when we get that particular service, we make sure that we have disk storage, disk, uh, disk level encryption, right? For the database, for the databases that we have from them. But then we also make sure that we have service level encryption. That means that we encrypt the data that we actually store over there. So even if there's someone on Cloudant that somehow, you know, they have an they have a, they, they insider job and, you know, they, they somehow they really, really want to have access to our data and they go and look at it, they, they still can't because, our, because the data that we're storing there is encrypted. Um, so, oh, and then backups. So the way that we actually handle backups is that we recycle backups. So we say, we make sure that every 14 days, we recycle our backups and we make sure that it reflects whatever's actually, what are, the, the data that we have available. Now, what's important here again is that for, for us, legally, that's an okay thing to recycle you know, every 14 days. It's not the case in every, you know, for every use case. So as Anton said, you know, it's a very legal thing outside of you know, my pay grade. Um, but yeah, so and the important thing is that we have all these APIs that we really give to the users and, and we 
we, we empower them, but also it makes it easier for us to make sure that, you, that, that the customers have full control over their own data. Okay, so in addition to that, the, what, what's really important is this idea of access tracking, making sure that users know or customers know when their data is being accessed, right? And so this is hard, this is, this is really important from an identity point of view when we, have, when we talk about the authentication. And so, for example, every time you authenticate, every time your attributes change, every time your profile is updated or deleted or whatever, right? So we have, we actually have, uh, we, we, we have, uh, so we have event notifications and we're using a, uh, one of the services that IBM Cloud offers, um, Activity Tracker. Um, and so, so users can come and basically have a look and see, oops, they don't, they come and have a look and see, they can, they can see, you know, when events happened, what, what actually got, you know, what the results were, uh, the times and so forth. And so that's, yeah. I'll just add here, this is a conceptual slide, right? Just showing a specific use case. But you need to track all of that, right? You need to track whenever the configuration was changed, right? Whenever a particular, so this is authentication. As I said, this is conceptual because we're authentication service. What about users being added, updated, deleted, authenticated through a particular provider, right? Changing configuration. So all of that, all of it also needs to be tracked. Okay, and for that, we're using the access tracking or activity tracking. And uh, as a customer, right, you can export all the data, store it in your archives, take it to some audit processing company, we're going to, right? So we'll give you data and you can do with that data what you want. Um, yeah, and then just, just, just to really drive the point home, and I know I've, I've, I've mentioned it before, but it's really important to actually to mention is that we've put the management part of, at, at least for us, what makes sense is that we, we, we don't want to own the data. We've put the management part of the data onto the, the, the owners. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, the, it's a responsibility of the customer. It's the responsibility of the user, right? And so and we do this via endpoints. We do this on consoles and so forth and, you know, the point is that we process it, we, we, we store it, but we don't own it, and we don't do anything with it. And that's really, I think, one of the key parts of GDPR, that you know, the ownership part is, is super important. We, we, you, I think it's, a, it's, it's risky. And, and so as you're developing applications, as you're developing services, you want to make sure that you have proper, a, a, a proper, I guess, gateway to your data, I don't know how else to say it, but so that, so that the control is always given to, to the, the end user. Uh, I think that's it for um, yeah. um, my side. So, so the, the end user can decide what should be done with the data. A controller uh, customer of ours, right, needs to, you know, make this decision happen. And we provide tools for a controller to actually make this happen. Okay, so that's the change. And yeah, and uh, if you have any questions. Yeah, we'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Absolutely. So, on your backups. So like when, I, when, when, I, when we have to restore something for a day, we can go back to step in here. Like, if someone, and I assume you guys have backup, and I assume you guys are storing these backups for historical purposes or, or whatever. If, if someone wants to be removed, but let's multiply this by you know ten thousand people at one time. So mm -hmm. how do we yeah, Does the company have to get each of those states for when they first existed and start building each one of these? So we're only storing backups for fourteen days. Yeah. We're not storing them beyond that. Okay, so uh, we're storing backups in order to restore the service in case of data loss regional failure, right? So we have enough data, so we'll be able to restore the service to the last working point, okay? But we do not keep data beyond that. And again, it, it, it becomes a responsibility. If the customer wants their data to be, to be, to be kept, to be stored longer, mm -hmm. then you can export your data yep. and store it however you want. We have those APIs. You, as a customer of ours, as controller, you can export the data at any point and store back, hey, export the data daily and store it anywhere you want. Okay, but we are not storing our backups beyond 14 days. 
Yes. Um, so you mentioned that, and I have two questions. Whenever I can ask. There's two of us. Perfect. I'll take the easy one. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know if one's easier than the other. You mentioned that um, based on the size of the organization, you must assign a DPO. Understand the DPO must report to executive leadership, which some companies would restructure to mm -hmm. happen. Um, I, are you aware of what that size requirement is? I mean, the only thing I've seen is uh, if they require regular and systematic processing of data subjects on a large scale. Is it org size more, or is it the size of the data? That's a or? good question I do not have answer for, but I can give you a link where to find this information. Okay. Right, because okay. DTO piece is described very well in the docs. Right, we have a link down here, and yes. there's a section there talking specifically about DPOs. About the, and about okay. the size of the organization when yeah. the yeah. flag is... Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the way uh, I think we've implemented this, yes, we have a DPO uh, on a higher level, right? And then for each, we'll, we'll call ourselves tribe, right? So we're part of cloud security tribe, okay? Uh, we have a security focal for our tribe, and we have a bunch of other tribes. And that person is actually responsible for bringing all the practices and processes into the tribe, making sure we're compliant. So compliance, not just the GDPR, yeah, HIPAA, SOC, whatever. GDPR. We have a dedicated person whose responsibility, its sole responsibility is making sure all of our stuff is compliant. And right. this is not the person that, you know, no one ever heard. No, this is the person heavily involved on most stages of design probably besides the why. And with the enterprise size organizations, it's really clear, you know, their guidance is clear. My mm -hmm. question is more for the medium size medium business, size. you know, when they transition from somebody that's maybe responsible for security risk, compliance and privacy, to some of this privacy only. Yep. And... Th that's the reason I don't have answer to your question coming from IBM. Right, right. <laughs> but uh, yes, I'll, I'll show you where to find this information. Perfect. Mm -hmm. um, second question. Um, so I understand in GDPR, there may or may not, my understanding is there's a requirement that the data that you share with the customers be in a, um, a popular format, so it's easy for them to digest. Yeah. Um, and so my question is, and I've seen other organizations like Facebook um, provide you an easy to use medium over which to get it, namely in the same web console interface mm -hmm. that you navigate through the app and your settings you can download. Your mm -hmm. So my question for you is, you mentioned multiple times you set up an API for customers to gain access to information. Yes. And is that a sufficiently easily accessible medium over which they would access it? So we're providing UI as well. Okay. okay we do have UI. We have a uh, FID dashboard. Not everything we have over API is provided in UI. Okay. So we're following in general API first approach. And then to make things simpler, we're providing dashboards, uh, UI dashboards as well. Okay. So API just gives you, gives you more. Yeah, but a, 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 another point to, to your question is that I think that a lot of times these, these, uh, these easy to digest terms of agreement are from the, the, from the data controllers right. mm -hmm. as opposed to the processors. Right. Yeah. And so essentially, we, so when we say we provide you with the APIs, so now the data controllers have to actually take that, those APIs, build whatever terms of agreements they want, right? Make them in the format that, that's agreeable, that's easily digestible, and then, and then provide it to the end user. So kind of we, I think in, in this instance, I think that we, so we do, provide, we do provide a dashboard, but again, I think what you're asking might be a more of a data controller kind of question. Yeah. Oh, because you guys are considered data processors. Yes, we're more of a data processor. Exactly. Okay, so in most cases, the way I like to put it, uh, use end users who are authenticating through our service they don't even have any idea they're using our service or yeah. IBM Cloud or whatever, okay. right? So uh, we're, we're internal, thing. we're making developers' life easier, right? Okay. And developer can make, uh, can make users' life easier. Right, I'm better understanding mm -hmm. your project and how you guys are part of yeah. it. Thank you. Any other questions? Sure. Uh, you know, you said you did, you identified the thing in the money question in the bank? No. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not saying that, so I, I don't care. <laughs> no, it's, that, that's a good question. Okay, that's a bedtime reading. <laughs> Lottery. Um, yeah. Um, any other last questions? Is there a standard uh, for the privacy impact assessment? You saw that one for a team I was used to the privacy impact assessment, that the standard form of shared costs as a global. That's a global shared assessment. So, 
we did have one in our company built by you know our people, right? I'm not familiar with any global standard form that you can fill, right? Uh, the way I recall we addressed it is we actually read that 260-page document and created was an enormous spreadsheet, right? Which every single service had to fill, right? Standard compliance thing. Right. Uh, I'm not familiar with any standardized tool. Well, I'm assuming there are some startups who are doing that, right? It's a great way to make money, GDPR, right? But uh, I'm not familiar with anything specific. No other questions. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks a lot.